the webinar is a part of the uh, celebration of the World Veterinary Week, uh, which is initiated by uh, World uh, Institute of Gadwasu. And in this uh, World Veterinary Week celebration, we have uh, uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, which is mainly focused on the veterinarians COVID-19 crisis. And this webinar will be comprises of around 50 and in, in which we have three talks, which will be around 10 to 15 minutes. And first will be given by me, then Dr. Rajneesh, and uh, third will be given by the Dr. Pankaj Dhaka. So in this webinar, we will talk about the COVID-19 and uh, the different, uh, uh, you can say, association with the animals, with the one health framework, as well as uh, what were the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the animal husbandry section. So uh, I'm going to start with the first uh, lecture, which is the uh, impact on the animal husbandry. So uh, since uh, more than one year has been uh, happened uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19, which was started in Wuhan city of China, uh, and uh, the pneumonia cases were found in cluster of uh, some patients where the novel coronavirus was detected. <clears throat> this SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, by the WHO in March, 11th of March, 2020. And the disease was designated as a COVID-19 disease. And uh, this is considered as a priority pathogen by the WHO. And uh, the speculations are that this virus has been jumped from the bats because the bat coronavirus has a maximum similarity with this uh, new coronavirus. So the spillover of this virus may occur directly from the bats in the Wuhan sea market to the human beings and then the transmission of human to human occurs. And the second speculation is that uh, this virus was spilled over from bats to the pangolin, which acted as intermediate host. And then from pangolin, the virus jumps to the human, and then it's spread from human to the uh, uh, next susceptible humans. And if you remember, uh, during last uh, year, this time we were in lockdown period, uh, which was started from the 25th of March and it ended up to the 31 or 31st May. So almost uh, more than two months the, we faced the lockdown period uh, because of the corona uh, pandemic. And uh, during this period, uh, we observed a lot of crises which still are ongoing because of the second wave of coronavirus. And uh, it has been estimated that because of this pandemic, uh, more than 130 million people, they have lost their jobs, okay? And this disease has affected not only the person who are doing the business on roads, but it also affected the multinational business across the world. And, and uh, surprise- class, class, okay. self-indicating that we are living in a global community or in a global village. And if you see that recent data, around one, around 15 crore cases have been occurred because of the corona and more than 30 lakhs deaths have been occurred throughout the world. And if we talk about the human uh, cases in India, uh, around 1.5 crore cases have been reported uh, with more than 1,80,000 deaths. And this COVID-19, uh, it has impacted or it has affected the each and every segment uh, uh, which is operating in this globe uh, because of the imposition of the curfew, lockdown measures, uh, then the prohibition of the trade, then the uh, ban on the travel, maybe local, national or international travel. Along with all sectors, the animal husbandry sector was not also left. It has suffered a huge setback because of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you uh, see the some of the uh, newspaper cuttings or the uh, media reports, there was information that during the first two days of the lockdown, 
there was a surge of around 15 to 20 percent demand of the milk because the people they want to store milk uh, maybe in the form of the liquid milk or maybe in the form of the powder made milk and even uh, i share my experience i bought uh, three or four packets of the uh, powder milk uh, from the birka for the future uh, usage of the milk pop in the in our home but after two days of the lockdown there was a substantial reduction in the demand around 25 to 30 percent of the milk demand was down uh, during first lockdown period uh, which was because of the uh, prohibition in the travel closure of the local uh, or roadside tea stalls uh, closure of the restaurants sweet shops right and it also happened because of the hindrance in the transportation of the milk to the consumer uh, only the uh, well aware uh, producer who were having their own transportation system they were able to transport milk to the houses in which they were able to deliver and many farmers they were at the distress sale of milk by, and they sell the milk at around 50 percent reduction in the price right and many farmers even they they throw their milk on the roads which were highlighted in the news channels and the media reports and uh, still uh, the process is continuous uh, we are not up to the mark uh, uh, we can say that we were there at uh, the time period before the pre lockdown or the pre corona pandemic if you see these graphs there is a, a drastic reduction in the milk procurement as well Well, as a milk sale during the uh, first year to the level which was before the pre-lockdown period. Similarly, uh, the COVID-19 impacted a lot of on poultry. Uh, even before the disease report in India, there were media rumors that the COVID-19 can be spread through the consumption of chicken or the eggs produced by the hens. And these rumors were so, uh, you can say, uh, painful for the poultry producers that uh, advisories were issued by the government of India or state government and even for the uh, institutes. And even uh, our department gave a, a TV talk uh, on to tackle these rumors that there is no harm uh, when you consume chicken which is uh, properly cooked and eggs, they are properly cooked. Rather, the chicken and egg, egg products, they provide or they boost the immunity of the, uh, you can say, consumers, which may be at exposure to the uh, coronavirus. So there were different hurdles uh, uh, or rumors which were overcome and the poultry industry, it suffered a huge losses uh, during the lockdown because of the coronavirus. And pig farmers, they also suffered a lot because the marketing or the market was not open during that days. And the farmers, they have to keep pigs for the longer period. And uh, they have to suffer economic losses because they need to feed the pigs. And because of the overgrowth of the pigs, they were not uh, even acceptable after the lockdown. So the farmers, they suffered uh, huge economic losses, which were keeping the pigs as a food animal. Similarly, uh, many marginal and uh, uh, landless farmers or the small holding, they keep sheep and goat uh, for their livelihoods. Um, but uh, they also suffer uh, uh, huge because of the COVID-19. And uh, in, especially in the Jammu and Kashmir, the nomadic pastoral people, they, they took their animals to the areas where the food is available for their animals. But because of the habit uh, transportation, they were not able to transport their animals to the particular sites. So they suffered with the uh, significant impact on their economic status. Similarly, uh, uh, you have uh, seen that a lot of uh, animals, especially ponies and horses and uh, camels, they are involved in the tourism. So because of this lockdown period, there was a prohibition on the tourism and many uh, uh, the, uh, rearers of camel and horses, they suffered or they were affected by the lockdown period. You know that uh, desert tourism is very popular in Rajasthan. Then at many uh, 
pilgrimage or hill station the ponies are very common for the transportation of tourism so all they uh, suffered a huge uh, uh, during this covid 19 pandemic so uh, there are a lot of issues uh, i'm not uh, going into detail about all these uh, but yes uh, to tackle these issues which uh, the animal husbandry has suffered or suffering uh, the various organization at the international fronts as well as the national level they have issued recommendations or advisories to prevent the uh, impact on the animal husbandry uh, sector like fao has a given recommendation that the countries should uh, they they should produce the safety nets uh, for the supply of continuous feed to the uh, animal farmers and the transporter of uh, these animal feed trucks they should be allowed they should be given special permit to reach in the remote areas and uh, there should be establishment of emergency management procedures Uh, including communication to mitigate rumors and advise stakeholders uh, regarding the uh, ongoing situation of the pandemic and also get their feedback what they want from the government institutes or what they uh, in the form of advisories or in the form of uh, some suggestion from the institutes right and the countries they should allow food markets to remain open but uh, they should also maintain the physical distancing the public should be conscious about the adoption of good hygiene practices as well as the good respiratory practices and the countries or the state should open the or the borders should be open for the import and export of the uh, animals which are essential for the maintenance of the uh, food chain and the transboundary sport livestock to ensure the essential resources for the uh, pastoralists or the nomads they so that they can take their animals to the uh, food rich sources for their animals and the financial measures which uh, i appreciate indian government they have uh, already uh, uh, mentioned a lot of schemes in the form of financial measures to the farmers uh, like in the form of temporary subsidies Uh, emergency loan direct stimulus package tax exemptions extension for the loan repayments grace period low interest rate and direct public investment and the subsidies and the government has also initiated subsidies to the agri food sector to maintain the activities during the lockdown and after the lockdown uh, period and uh, this is the advisory issues by the icer that uh, should be followed by the dairy farmers or sheep and goat farmer piggery farmer or poultry farmer that they should reduce the movement of the visitors the visitor or the workers they should be able to wear mask thermal scanning should be uh, advisable the visitor or the workers they should sanitize their hand they maintain the social distancing and if somebody is found ill he should be uh, taken care of standard health measures and the animal farm equipments should be properly cleaned and sanitized regularly and they should not be exchanged with the other colleagues who are handling the animals so this is a, a very uh, brief we can say about the uh, the impact uh, uh, which has animal husbandry sector faced or even i would say facing at many Uh, fronts because of the corona 19 pandemic thank you so much now i uh, invite dr rajneesh to share his screen and uh, present his finding thank you dr bedi so the topic that has been assigned to me so i hope i am audible to everyone all right Uh, yes. <clears throat> the topic that has been assigned to me it's uh, about uh, covid 19 in animals so let's start okay so i will not go into detail of uh, this but just to remind 
all of us and we all know that means this the story it it began uh, in the month of uh, december uh, 2019 uh, right and uh, <clears throat> it was in china and the city was wuhan all right and uh, <clears throat> The cases they are starting appearing uh, because of an unknown virus which is infecting uh, 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 people over there, and uh, the the picture on the on the extreme right it is of a food market, uh, which is Wuhan Huanan uh, Seafood Market, and the the picture of the person who is uh, processing uh, that meat it is from a, a street uh, food market of that city. So. <clears throat> So what if, uh, do, do we really know that whether this virus has been uh, transmitted from animals to humans? Currently it is transmitted between humans, right? But the origin of this uh, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome, Corona virus two, it's, it's, we don't know, right? So if you, if you remember the very, very first cases of uh, this uh, COVID-19, um, they were found to be associated with sea, uh, seafood market means either they are working there, they have visited that place, or somehow they were associated with uh, that uh, Wuhan, Wuhanan uh, <clears throat> market, right? So at that time, it was uh, thought that there could be an association between uh, animals and uh, emergence of this uh, this disease, uh, which is COVID-19. So, so uh, it was in uh, July last year uh, to find out the answer of this question: What is the origin of SARS coronavirus two? Uh, there was a joint study uh, which was started between uh, uh, WHO as well as China. So 17 members from uh, China, the experts from China, and then equal number of experts from uh, um, different international uh, agencies, uh, including WHO, FAO, and um, and other, other experts from other countries, they were involved in to find out the answer of this, uh, this, uh, this question. What is the origin of this virus, right? So, as I told you that the study started in July uh, 2020 last year, and they, they came up with this report and they prepared this report uh, this, this year in January to February. And the report was out uh, last month. Uh, and this, uh, according to this report, what they found. So these are the four scenario which uh, the experts uh, from different countries or different health agencies, uh, they, they, they came up with. So they proposed four hypotheses, right? And I hope you can, you are able to read this, the text. So what happens? So they, they gave four hypotheses. The hypothesis number one was that uh, it was due to some zoonotic spillover. Uh, second hypothesis, if you can see my cursor, so it was that it, it, it is through some intermediate host followed by spillover. So spillover have happened and then uh, uh, there it goes to some intermediate host. And then the third uh, hypothesis was through some frozen food, right? Through the food chain. And then the fourth uh, uh, hypothesis they gave is, uh, uh, it is the, uh, because of, uh, le uh, this, it was some kind of leakage of this virus from the lab, from the Wuhan lab, right? So I, I will uh, discuss the very first two uh, about this, which they, they found could be the most likely uh, reason for the origin of this SARS coronavirus, right? Okay, so this was the uh, very first scenario um, and they did some 
a kind of um, qualitative risk assessment in the in in which what they did is that they they gave a scale um it is known as lucas scale and then they gave whether it is not likely at all whether it is likely at all whether it is most likely and so on right so <clears throat> to find out the possible route of uh, uh, transmission in the initial stages of this outbreak or pandemic so they came up with the first one which they think it is uh, the likely uh, or possible route of transmission or origin of this infection where they come up with that so it was first transmitted from the from the bats right to the humans if you can see my cursor and then from humans to humans so the mutations happened and then the virus adapted it to transmit between humans only right so then there was transmission between humans so that was their first proposed uh, 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 hypothesis and then they uh, found that it, is, it, it could be the likely cause of this uh, this transmission right and then this is uh, considered as the second one uh, which they thought it is another uh, uh, route of transmission or origin of this uh, uh, SARS at the start. So where you can see that, uh, so it first goes to, uh, to the virus and then from that virus uh, goes to the bat, sorry. And then from that bat, it goes to some intermediate host. And from that intermediate host, it's, it's either go first directly into humans or consumption of that host that intermediate host to the humans, all right? So the previous one was the spillover, zoonotic spillover from bats to humans and then between humans. Second is from human, uh, from bats to um, an intermediate host, which they which they come up with that it could be most, most possibly it is uh, a pangolin, right? Pangolin is considered uh, of a uh, very good medicinal val value in China. Uh, people over there, they consume it. Uh, they <clears throat> and then there could be chances that through pangolin, it goes to humans and then started transmitting between humans after having uh, some mutations in those viruses. <clears throat> and these are the last two, uh, which they found them uh, could be the, uh, one of the route of transmission through directly through, you can see this uh, arrow. And if you can see my cursor from bats to humans via consumption, and then through pangolins to humans via consumption, right? And then the least or where they come up with that there is no chances at all from the, uh, the lab accident, right? So ultimately, to sum up this, uh, they come up with, out of these uh, two, they come up with the one which is most likely is the one from bats, then to pangolin and then to humans. And then the other one, the likely one is from bats, direct zoonotic spillover to humans, right? And then the other two, they didn't uh, give much uh, uh, gr uh, uh, importance to those. Okay, so I will try to finish in another four to five minutes because, okay. Next question comes, comes is which animal species right now they are getting infection, right? Whether the anim animals they are getting Corona or we can say COVID-19 currently or not. So this is the map. This I took from um, um, website or OIE website. And uh, if you can go there, uh, they provided sum up of all the cases reported till now. Currently more than 25 countries, they have reported uh, COVID-19 in animals. However, if we compare the number of animals infected as compared to the number of cases of humans, it is very, very uh, kind of negligible only few case reports have been seen but there are some reports so <clears throat> it has been noted first in hong kong in a dog uh, and what animal species if i talk about first of all about the pet animals 
So cats can be infected with this virus, dogs can be, and then ferrets can be. And why I started with cat? Because this is the one the most cases have been reported in. So in cat, most of the cases of COVID-19 have been reported. In dogs, also the cases have been reported, but lesser than cat. And then I think only one or two cases of uh, COVID-19 have been reported in uh, ferrets. And if we talk about wild animals, or um, the, most of the case reports in the wild animals, they have been from uh, captive wild animals, the animals which are in zoo, right? And if you if you see this I mean, from this slide, I just want to give you um, a message that the, the species of Felidae family, right? Or the cat family, they mostly cases are reported in those animals, right? You can see that it is in leopard, in tiger, in lion, in puma. And if you uh, see that, and if you remember, uh, outbreaks have been seen in Europe of uh, this farmed mink, all right? So mink is, a must, uh, is, a, is an animal from mustard family. It's, uh, it's farming is done for its fur. So cases have been, means outbreaks have been reported in these animals. And then again, a gorilla, gorilla form, a zoo has been found positive for this. And lab infections have been done. And these are all species where it has been seen that the susceptibility was high. Egyptian uh, fat, uh, uh, fruit eating uh, bat in cats, in ferrets, in uh, members of family family in in gorilla and ferret laboratory infections were given and then they they were uh, found highly susceptible uh, dog low susceptibility has been reported uh, extremely low in case of uh, cattle and pigs and in case of poultry they infected but no none of the bird were bird was found positive so to sum up this if you can see that means h means highly or high susceptibility, low susceptibility, extremely low, and then N means none. So these are the different species of animals on experimental infection. They were found highly susceptible, low susceptibility, and extremely low, and, and none at all, right? So this will help you to educate your client or to, to public. Oh, so what if uh, a person is COVID positive, right? And he is uh, having a pet, right? So is there, what do you think? Is there any, any chance of transmission of COVID-19 from that person to his or her pet? The answer is yes, there, there are chances. And the cases, some of the cases which have been reported in, in, in cats and dogs, somehow they, it has been seen that epidemiologically association has been found on uh, in those cases, right? So now the question comes, how or what precaution one should take when he or she is positive and is having a pet or is taking care of his animals, well, cattle, pigs, or poultry, right? In that case, we should, we treat these animals as our family members, right? So we should treat these animals at the time, at that time when we or someone is positive, again, as your family members, you separate yourself from your family for 15 days, right? Two weeks during that, that when you're positive. The same thing you have to do with your, with your pet. You have to isolate yourself. You don't have to come in contact with, if you're having another family members with you, you have to tell them, okay, now please you have to take care of this, right? For another 15 days. Similarly, if you're having cattle, however, I, to, I, I told you, however, the infection is, uh, they are the extremely low, low susceptibility is found in these animals, in pigs and cattle, but try to be, be, be careful, ask your family members to take care of those animals. Uh, don't come in contact with those animals. If you are alone in the family, you have to take care of the, those animals, then wear masks, don't sneeze over them, on them, or, um, um, and whenever you take, it, you take care of those animals, wash your hands before, wash your hands after, and just few um, hygienic measures you have to take care of, right? So 
Similarly, you have to educate your, your client also. The, the, the points are same, which I have already uh, told you. So with this, uh, I stop here and um, thank you very much. And over to uh, Dr. Pankaj. Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, very good morning and welcome to the third lecture of this series of webinar on COVID res uh, response of veterinarians against the COVID-19 crisis. So I want to thank my previous two speakers, Dr. J.S. Bedi, sir, for highlighting the role of veterinarians and the economic impact of COVID-19 on veterinary sector, which is quite neglected. And the second one by Dr. Rajneesh, sir, for highlighting the transmission cycle or possible transmission route um, in animals. Uh, so both of the lectures made my job much easy and I will try to focus more on one health framework uh, regarding COVID-19. Uh, so we can see, we can see the deaths, 30 lakh uh, mortality, which we used to hear in past uh, historical pandemics like Spanish flu, or like cholera, cholera pandemic or, or ancient plagues, okay? So our generation is facing such type of unprecedented situation first time or healthcare, everything is under stress. And still the, unfortunately, uh, the waves are coming up in various countries like in India is facing the second waves of the pandemic and uh, within no time, we may surpass the USA in case of cases as well as the mortality rate is quite high. So this is unique situation where we need to allocate our resources very judiciously. And we, we need to break the professional silos. That's why the One Health, role of One Health is very, very important during this time to tackle such type of pandemic. So as Dr. Rajneesh so already covered this, there are many theories about the origin of virus, starting from uh, labs to the bats and role of pangolins as intermediate host. Uh, but we must appreciate the role of wet markets. Uh, historically, the, uh, the wet animal markets has been linked to many previous pandemics, starting from our SARS uh, 2000. Uh, three outbreak. Uh, the, again, it was supposed to be sea wet cats from the wet markets of China. So these, these used to be very, very uh, important focal points of the outbreaks. Uh, why wet markets are important? I want to highlight one or two points. Uh, like uh, most of the wildlife reservoirs, uh, wildlife are the reservoirs for many new pathogens which it still are not in contact with human population. So once you are mixing wildlife with our domestic animals or other meat animals like chicken, poultry, ducks, uh, there are quite high chances of a spill out or of the pathogens from these wild animals to the domestic animals, and they may enter in the human chain. So the same thing has been um, hypothesized regarding COVID-19. Uh, pangolins, again, a uh, very important animal in China. It's huge medicinal important as well as a very good delicacy on the plate. And role of bats, again, remains very crucial like many, many other uh, outbreaks. Uh, the bats remain a very important reservoirs for many, many pathogens, uh, including over Nipah virus, uh, where the outbreak was there in 2017 in Kerala. So in current outbreak also, the homology between the coronavirus recovered from bat and the circulating coronavirus was around 96% nucleotide homology. So again, uh, they, are, they are postulating that bats may be the possible reservoir for this virus. So remember, uh, it might have started from one animal to one human and now it in full swing and looking down across the globe. So this is the possible transmission chain of this COVID-19. We can appreciate there might be the reservoir in terms of bad, there might be 
any intermediate host because the virus need some good intermediate host to jump into the human population. These transition used to be very slow, but this is unusual in case of current pandemic where, where everything happened so fast. So there might be any intermediate host. As already Dr. Hazniz explained, there might be minks, uh, ferrets, then over felines, they are on hot list. Uh, to be act as the intermediate host for this pathogen. Then now there is completely community to community transmission of this virus, means the virus is not depend on the animal reservoir. Now there is complete ongoing transmission between the human population. Uh, uh, might be in starting the virus took different parts of the globe through trade and travel, but now uh, full globe is under lockdown, so now independent uh, population cycles are going on. Uh, there is very less information about the basic reproduction number and mortality rate because these varies between countries to countries. There is no unique data and our understanding is growing up as the pandemic going on. Well, fortunately, now we are having good vaccines also. More things will come in future. And the point of now concern is muta mutation among the virus, okay? And these mutations, again, differ geographically. So previously, the first mutant was UK variant of concern, then South African, then Brazil, California, and two add in the list. Now we are having double mutant of India, that is B1.617. So these mutation, in the pathogen provide them more transmissibility and to some point to evade the immune response that previously has been generated against uh, different strain. So this is why the role of One Health is very, very important because uh, pandemic of such a large scale can't be handled by, by a alone profession. So we need to uh, uh, deem, uh, we need to combine different professional and we need to break the silos, professional silos to act more in synergistic way. So One Health itself, the definition by One Health Commission itself suggests it's a collaborative efforts of multiple health professions. Uh, it's very clear if you are acting alone or if you are acting in group, which one is beneficial. Obviously, when we are coordinating and we are using the resources judiciously, the output will be completely different when we are working in alone or in a uh, single professional silo. So, so that's very, very, very important to act synergistically to make the output more than whatever input we are giving, especially in such type of um, pandemics. So One Health is a, uh, not a new concept, what we can say, it's an age-old concept, but now it's gaining momentum because of many of the emerging zoonoses. So we, we, we can't separate human health, animal health, as well as environmental health, which is quite neglected. Uh, because the ecology of uh, pathogen, to know, knowing the ecology of pathogen is very, very important to trace back the correct transmission cycle. That's very, very important. So regarding zoonosis, uh, out of total infectious disease, 60% are the zoonosis. Out of the emerging infection, 75% are of zoonotic nature. Then out of every five new diseases which are coming up, three are of, of zoonotic nature. And out of total bioterrorist agent, 80% are pathogens are of zoonotic nature, means they are having origin in animals. So we can't neglect. And if you will see the pathogen under transition, there is quite uh, new uh, pathogens or pandemics are coming up. It's starting from over COVID-19, Nipah, Ebola, Zika, Mars, these all are of 21st century. And if you will see the downside, only we could have controlled that disease where only either human is the reservoir or the animal reservoir range is very, very narrow and we are having very good vaccinations against these diseases, we could provide lifelong or a long immunity. So if we will see the disease transmission concept, um, like COVID-19, first, generally the virus or pathogens used to circulate in uh, reservoir host. 
when due to any reason like uh, anthropogenic activities deforestation or any artificial contact with animals the pathogen can jump to human population and after many uh, uh, cycles one stage might come uh, where the human to human transmission might be very very feasible like over covid 19 so spillover between animals to humans is quite possible and uh, though the rate may be different for example in case of rna viruses the mutation rate is quite high due to the faulty proofreading mechanisms so the rate of transition might be different but the transmission or spillover is quite possible and and these speeds used to accelerate due to anthropogenic activities so always remember we used to share our micro as well as macro environment directly or indirectly with animals as well as other environmental components uh, one very good example i used to cite uh, i want to cite with you like antimicrobial resistance which might be the next biggest pandemic in near, near future uh we we can't blame human counterpart for this and we can't blame veterinary counterpart for this 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 should be the joint efforts because we know uh, from if any resistance will be there in animals it will directly or indirectly will come either through food chain or through environment to the humans so so such type of approach need a very good collaborative synergistic approach to to highlight the different epidemiological cycles or point to tackle such type of issue so it's very good saying that resistance in anywhere means the resistance in everywhere because we can't control the transmission cycle especially for such type of complex scenario where all these three human animal and environment is quite interlinked so uh, this is good story means if you will see alone you you may describe the problem in different sense what is it is actually so it's very very important crucial to take the advice from different professional silos to take advice from expert of that areas and hit the right target that's why one health is very very important and it's gaining momentum even in india so we must coordinate communicate and collaborate to to generate evidence based Uh, suggestions control programs or or cost effective interventions so intersectoral collaboration in covid-19 pandemic also going on we we know various global agencies is perfectly coordinating like world health organization fao and oi also regularly generating the um, advisory regarding veterinary science national level also we are we are coordinating well in vaccines and therapeutics r and d with life science professionals then uh, good diagnostic facilities like or uh, around seven veterinary universities is actively participating in uh, covid 19 diagnosis including over gadwasu then in 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 on the front of public awareness and compliance for covid appropriate behavior all the agencies are are working at their best level so regarding one health in india the the theme is gaining much momentum uh, there are many collaborations at icmr and icr level to prioritize the diseases and and to make the committee at at the professional levels then we are having many state specific levels so collaboration like revis in tamil nadu then dbt is coming up with uh, one health road map and they are involving all the possible this medical and veterinary universities to 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 highlight the prioritize issues and to 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 frame the policies for them regarding their control and prevention measure uh, obviously covid-19 testing lab in veterinary in collaboration in with medical counterparts is going on and in last budget the government announced the formation of uh, national institute of one health at nagpur and we we are we are sure that in coming future the the uh, uh, team of one health will not only gain the momentum but in true sense it will bridge various professional silos so generally on november 3rd we used to celebrate uh, international one health day and it's very very important now 
uh, and uh, I'm sure that after COVID-19 pandemic, the things will get much momentum as it was previous. So thank you so much uh, for attending the webinar. And I want to acknowledge uh, our Dean, uh, Dr. SPS Guman sir, our director, Dr. GS Vedi sir, and IDBP cell members for making this event uh, uh, in very convenient manner. Thank you so much. Uh, so on behalf of the Center for One Health, uh, I also uh, wish to pay thanks to uh, the Vice Chancellor. Uh, who's a visionary uh, remarks to celebrate the World Veterinary Day in the form of World Veterinary Day uh, Week is uh, uh, very much appreciating. And uh, Dr. SPS Woman, Dean College of Veterinary Sciences, he is always a source of motivation and encouragement for uh, faculty of College of Veterinary Science. <clears throat> and uh, I'm also thankful to Dr. Rajneesh and uh, Dr. Pankaj for their quite informative and interesting lectures, uh, presentations. So as rightly said that uh, One Health Framework or approach is the need of art. And uh, we have seen uh, that uh, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, each and every segment uh, which we can say is associated with the One Health approach has been participating uh, like doctors, they are treating the patients, the life scientists, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are involved in the developing of diagnostic kits, <clears throat> in the uh, preparation of the vaccine. Then the veterinarians, uh, they are also involved in the testing of the COVID-19 uh, patients, like around 19 institutes of the veterinary sciences. They are involved in the diagnostics of COVID-19. Then the environmental scientists, they are, they are doing a lot of efforts in the sanitization programs uh, of the environment. Then the social scientists, uh, they, are, they are also playing a, an important role to create awareness among the masses. They are going home to home to make people aware or to sensitize the population regarding the uh, testing for their COVID-19, as well as nowadays they are doing a lot of efforts uh, to sensitize the population regarding the vaccination campaign initiated by the uh, prime minister. So I would say each and every segment, they are playing a very good role. And uh, I hope this uh, associations or the collaborations uh, will be continued uh, so that in the future we can uh, solve the problems of uh, uh, global importance, uh, which we are now facing, or maybe in futures they will be created by the uh, natural phenomena or by the man-made phenomena. So, uh, uh, the importance of the collaboration is a very important, uh, especially in, in the developing countries such as like in India. So uh, for the UG students uh, whose regular class was in, uh, was in this time period, so for UG students uh, of third year, uh, this three talks will be part of your uh, course curriculum because you have a lecture on the disaster management and the COVID-19 is the biggest disaster we have seen in this century or even in the previous century. So I would like to suggest you that uh, you compile or make a note from these three talks and uh, uh, you write in the form of your uh, lecture notes, which may be asked to you in a, uh, uh, your examination in the, uh, for this unit or maybe in an uh, annual examination also. So I'm happy that more than 100 participants, they joined this, uh, uh, this Zoom meeting and they showed their interest. So uh, with the time constraint, we have a time constraint, but uh, if somebody wants to ask uh, some question or if somebody has uh, some queries, uh, he or she is most welcome. We have a, a weekend, uh, we can uh, have few minutes. Uh, so we can share with the, our views regarding your question or queries. Or even uh, I would say you can ask later on uh, uh, if you have a time constraint uh, at your end. You can email, you can WhatsApp me or uh, the other uh, presenters.
Okay, uh, if you don't have any question or queries, uh, we wind up this uh, Zoom meeting. And uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Rajneesh and Pankaj for uh, organizing this event and IDP cell for making this event happen. So thanks to one and all for participation and uh, uh, delivering your lecture. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I am ending this meeting. Thank you very much once again. Bye now. Thanks.